everyone welcome to know your gear live qa number 75 uh before we start i want to make a couple announcements the first is that tomorrow july 28th in glendale arizona at the sam ash i'll be doing the restring event that's 10 hours of me restringing and checking your guitars basically filling out sheets on them if you live in the area please show up you don't have to make any kind of arrangements or anything you just come to the event and uh put me to work it's uh, it's free to you and we'll talk about that today as well i promise the other thing i want to talk about is also the friends of the channel that's something that's important to mention uh real quick i'll just go down the first list it's just bradulus jeff howes zachary rowe michael newman bruce and the one blood we band hannah gunson john Jex, michael shy justin mabe and david madison and lawrence petros of lpd pedals and i have to admit he's right here next to me he's right there uh so i thought i would uh have lawrence come on the show because it's my birthday and we went to lunch uh with the fam my wife and my daughter and lawrence and i went had a good lunch right yeah it was great lunch and i uh, said hey once once we do lunch afterwards why don't you come and join the live show and uh for my birthday i'll make him answer all the questions and i'll just sit here and store energy for tomorrow's restring event. Sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, it's a deal. <laughs> because everybody's been giving me a hard time all week about how tired I'm going to be from doing the event. And I was like, no. But the problem is it's like 185 degrees in Arizona with 114% humidity. <laughs> so, so I'm not going to lie. Um, I've been debating of bringing a little fan tomorrow. Right. Just, just to because <laughs> it's, it's been a warm week, everybody. So I just thought uh, I'd start that. Um, real quick, Cheddar Kung Pao. What's up, Cheddar? I was on Cheddar's uh, show last Sunday. If you guys haven't checked it out, I'll put a link in the description again if you, you guys want to see that. It was three hours of guitar talk. I'm pretty sure it was all guitar talk. We didn't. And uh, anyways, so if you want to check that out, you can uh, you know listen to it, download it, stream it, whatever, watch it. If you. Uh, but uh, thank you, Cheddar, for the for the super chat and. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? What do we got going on? Anyone have an exciting week? How do I get rid of this? <laughs> see, Lawrence is going to see firsthand. It's chaos. It's yeah. pure chaos. What is that? It's like it was there just go. like trapped. Okay. It needs so to catch up. Or whatever. needs to catch up. Uh, let's see. Phil Smith said he was outside watching the moon eclipse. That's the, cool. The, yeah, the, there super, was super blood moon or something. Really? Today. Yeah, yeah. So a blood moon is like the, isn't that like, uh, I know from the Predator movies, that's the hunter's moon, right? That's or is that, they, it, no, that's different. I the think blood the moon, hunter's moon is different. So what's a blood moon? It's like uh, red? Yeah, I guess. I, I don't know that I've ever seen one. Yeah. We've had like two this year, I think. Blood moons? Yeah. Or maybe it was last year. And All right, and Phil Smith, you're going to have to cause me to Google all this stuff after the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I appreciate it. Got to look it up um let's see what else we got going on it must be friday evening and afternoon it must be mike yes with phil and lawrence you're correct um we're going to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about today but it's probably going to be guitar stuff <laughs> so um we'll hit some super chats justin mabe happy birthday he just said happy birthday into the super chat that's nice of you justin that uh, thank you again for Facebook uh, saying happy birthday on Facebook too uh, John Parsons says for your fan at the restring event yeah <laughs> yeah yeah like I said I probably am gonna take one um, it's an air-conditioned obviously it's inside guys it's gonna be great inside the store you know tons of guitars air conditioning but I'm just sitting there thinking about this humidity it's in Arizona it's the humidity that makes everything kind of miserable because yeah. it's such a dry heat here uh, what were we saying the humidity was? That's like 35%, which is still pretty dry, but not for us. Yeah, not for us. 35%, and it's like a, it was 118 earlier this week. Wednesday, I think. And yeah. it's probably like 185 today. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying that. It's a good so, number. You know what? We've had our airport shut down once from the heat. That's that's all you need to know about Arizona. <laughs> so, uh, is that Crush? Yeah, Crush 8888. Just did a super chat. You guys, you don't have to do super chats, but I appreciate it. Uh, it's uh, let's uh, let's get some questions. Let's talk about some gear. Let's see what we got going on. Uh, I love the happy birthday wishes. I appreciate that. What's great is so you know, you guys know now. If you don't notice on YouTube, all of this, uh, all of this scrolling questions, all this stuff is kept on the replay. So when right, I do the replay right. and the index, it I'll be able to read all the happy birthdays that you guys put. I appreciate that so much. Um, 
Let's see. Um, what? Uh, Justin wants to know what kind of acoustic is that? That's a breed love. I have two identical ones. I have this one and I have a, a burst one, a burst color one. Uh, it's really nice. And uh, I like the breed loves. The necks are really small. They play like electric guitars. These nice. are set up silly, easy playing. Like I play these acoustics like this isn't the big boomy good acoustic sound. This is definitely the tinny acoustic sound because yeah. I have the action so low. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing I have in my craw to get is I want to get a Martin acoustic one of those for mica body you know the black ones right i forget the model but it's the for mica body body with the multiple laminate neck right um don't be shocked tomorrow at sam ash if i see one i buy one i've been i've been thinking about getting one i used to have one and um i got rid of it and i've regretted it ever since hmm. so sound great martin very, can make anything sound great very resilient in our wonderful yeah yeah the, they do they do well um and you can use it as a cutting board. You can, right? Yeah, you right. can. Just, yeah, you can just chop stuff on it. So, yeah, board. paddle a canoe with it. So, self defense. And you guys are awesome. It's like, uh, oh, hold on, Zim's guitars, which it's Neil here. Hey, Neil. It says, I if I use a seven point, uh, seven point five volt adapter on a sixty eight drive pedal, will it work like a Marshall on a Variac? Uh, yes, to some degree. You'll probably notice there's more overdrive. Um, the tone will probably get darker uh, and fuzzier. Should still work, though, seven and a half volts. Yeah. Yeah, because you're just starving it from voltage. Right? right. Yeah. And you can do, so here's my guess. So my guess is if you use one of those adjustable voltage supplies, like Dan Electro has mm -hmm. one, you could probably go down to one volt. And all the way up, right? Doesn't it choke all the way down? Because some pedals, to me, what I've noticed is when you try to use those uh, variable voltage uh, power supplies, pedals either shut off, right, or they literally let you take them down, and they get mushy and squishy. I've right. never found a pleasing sound. And by the way, you Neil, know, personal opinion for me: anytime you starve the voltage on a pedal, so even though there's all this amazing talk about how you get this special sound like a SAG battery or, or right. a battery with low. My, my experience is the opposite. Upping voltage is always made it better. So like if you have like on yours, you can do nine or 18 or no? Uh, on version two, you can do nine or 18. Yeah, on the originals is nine only. So I've always noticed anytime you have that option where you can do the nine, 18 thing, you do 18, it sounds better, crisper, tighter. Yeah, yeah it opens it up a bit. Um, I never do it though, just because the way my power supplies are set up on my boards. But, right. Um, so I didn't cut you off though. So no, it's okay. one down to one volt. No, yes. No, I don't know. Uh, the the uh, switching won't work that low. That's the circuit would work fine, but the because it uses a relay switching circuit in it, um, and it won't switch at seven and a half volts. I think it'll still switch, but any lower than that, it probably won't switch. And the uh, the sixty eight deluxe at seven and a half goes into bypass. It's got a brownout feature on it. So anything lower than than uh, seven and a half volts, it switches over to bypass. The uh, how many volts? Seven and a half. Seven and a half. So after seven, so if you keep saying it down, it yeah, it just it stays in bypass. Stays in bypass. Yeah. So that if you get a brownout like at a gig or something, it you know it'll everything else is going to go haywire anyway. But it right just sends the signal to bypass until the voltage comes back up. So. Good to know. Well, the good news is, Neil, you can do it. Yeah, try it. Yeah. Um, speed for hire, Phil. Is it, oh, it says Phil. Speed for hire is the person. It says, Phil, I bought two new Gibson SG Special T's this week. Uh, special T's. What's the T again? I hate it. I, I just looked this up uh -huh. a couple weeks ago because somebody asked about this. Uh, it says, on sale, they both have issues. Uh, I'd have to know what the issues are. I'm curious. Uh, it's not uncommon, you know, the whole everybody beats Gibson for having issues. Right. Um, you know, the sad thing about stuff like that is I've I've found Gibsons at the Guitar Center, and I'm just saying Guitar Center because there's one by me, that are unplayable. Like I picked them up off the wall. One one day, me and Ralph got a lot of grief for it. It's funny that me and Ralph just bought SGs. He bought an SG too, by the way. He bought one yeah. before me and Ralph. Yeah, about this time last year, I think. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and he has the same one as Ralph. I do. So you have the 2017 standard yes cherry the heritage cherry with the uh mustachio 
pick car. Yep, and yeah. the 57, 57 classics. 57 classics, yeah. So, um, so he was first, and then we copied him. So, uh, but what's funny was uh, me and Ralph got a lot of grief. It's funny. That's, I only point this out because we bought one. But about six, seven months, some months ago, we went and tried to buy one at Guitar Center, and there were, the ones where we found were horrible. And one in particular was so bad that we were ashamed that it would even exist as a, as a guitar. And when we said that on the live show, a lot of people gave us grief saying, yeah. you know, you're just bagging on Gibson. And I'm like, no, I'm trying to buy one. So, um, spe uh, just that specific one. Yeah. Speed yeah. for hire. Uh, uh, yeah, we tried a bunch, you know, we, we, uh, Ralph, Ralph tried a bunch of SGs. That's why it took him forever to try to get one. And that's why when I saw one on the local Craigslist and the deal looked right and everything looked right, I bought it for him because I knew that it's, you know, that's hard. The, the part of the handmade thing is, is you're going to get flaws, but that's not an excuse. It's just kind of expl explaining it. So that's why I wish the Gibson dealers would stock more Gibson. Yeah. Because it's hard to buy them online. It just is. So, yeah, you really need to touch them. <laughs> need to touch them. Mario says Gibson is bagging on Gibson. Yeah, you know, it's a brand. It's a brand we love and hate and love to hate. You know what I mean? That's how Gibson is. It's it's a part of history. There's so many great things about Gibson and then there's so many goofy stupid things about Gibson. Yeah. And uh, my personal thing is it, I, I don't, I don't care if they have flaws because how I look at it is all these guitars you see behind me, except for the one I just reviewed this week that I just got, I picked, you know what I mean? I just found them and picked them and right. there was something about it um, that I liked. And, and that's how it just has to happen for every guitar for me. Um, it's just, there's more likelihood that you'll find a better one at certain brands, you know what I mean? Than others. So, and by that note, like I said, I've personally, I always tell people my, my best luck I think I've ever had with guitars. Like when somebody asks me like, what's the brand you've seen the most consistency of quality? It's always been Schecter. And I could say PRS, but the problem with PRS is I've definitely handled more $500 Korean Schecters in my life. Right. Numbers, volume. Sure. Than $3,000 PRSs. $3,000 PRSs, I've, I've touched hundreds maybe. But I mean, I've touched thousands over, you know, all the, all the years of yeah. the Schecters. And the Schecters always like, man, just really good and, and i tell everybody it's not the you know everybody knows the korean factories world manufacturers good factory and you, everybody knows the stuff but i have always said this forever it's really schecter's ability to make sure that the the bad ones don't get to the public right the quality control yeah so let's uh let's find some super chats let's refresh this because we let some stack up let me grab one real quick um where do we leave off let's see uh cheddar then with justin Okay, so here's it is. Alexander asks, hey, Phil, love the show. Thank you, Alexander. Uh, what's your honest opinion on the new neighbor Immerse Reverb pedal? Uh, like it or something more? So uh, I reviewed that pedal, and funny enough, I reviewed that pedal because they gave it to me. They sent it to me, and they let me have it. And um, I I would love to say, you know, I, I, I love it, but here's what's good about it. I still have it. I reviewed it way over a year ago, if not longer, and I still have it. It, ha it hasn't left my, you know, because I could obviously s sell it because they sure they just said keep it. Um, I really enjoy that pedal. Um, for reverbs for me, I have three reverbs. I'm confirming because I'm looking right now that I use. I use the Hall of Fame pedal, which is the Hall of Fame 2, but to me it's the same. I have that uh, 63 Boss reverb that I really like. Right. And I have... Um, and I have that new neighbor. Now I also have the Skyver by Moore. Uh, and I never seem to use that one. And it has nothing to do with anything that I never grab it. The reverb I grabbed the most for some reason is 63 verb. This one, just because I like the old school kind of sure. springy kind of deal with it. Um, but that immerse reverb is great. I, I really like it a lot. Um and uh, and I like it so much that I didn't sell it. So what's interesting about that, and the reason I'm telling you this, Alexander, is that one of the things I have to always talk about, or at least I talk about on this channel, is when you don't, when you become a, a reviewer and companies give you product, one of the things I can't I tell you guys is how it feels the purchase point. Right. When I buy stuff, that's why when I buy stuff, I always disclose to you that I bought it versus when it was given to me. Because one of the things that you can't say when I when somebody gives you something, and just like a present, if somebody sure. gave you two as a gift, the pain of the purchase isn't sure. factored in. I Changes don't think the value. Yeah, I don't sit there and go, oh man, I don't know if I'd want this or my three hundred dollars again. Right. Right. 
But uh, the thing about the, the thing that's nice about New Neighbor and the Immerse pedal is I like it because I prefer to keep it than have the money. Because I know if I sold it, I think I could probably get 200 bucks for it or something. So I'd rather have it than the money. Um, and so uh, I really like it. So, and I don't tend to review anything I don't think I'm going to hold on to or like for a long period of time. So I, I like the, the Immerse. Have you tried that pedal? Um, just uh, here when we uh, tried it, it was quite a while back. Um, I thought it was good. Yeah, so. they, they they do good. I like their pedals. They're they're good stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're made in the USA. Yeah. So that's an impressive thing for a digital type company. You know what I mean? But their price reflects it because I think the Hall of Well, no, the Hall of Fame's not much cheaper. So, so I mean that, that tells you a lot. Uh, John Parson just said, "Hey, for the uh, oh for the fam, we already talked about that." Uh, and then the next one is uh, Buzz Wilson says, "Happy birthday, Phil!" Speaking of birthdays. What are the problems with running delay reverb before the preamp as opposed to the effects loop? Well, I'm going to give it to the pedal guru. Yeah, here. thanks. Um, no problems, just a different type of uh, sound. It's uh, it can, I guess, basically boil it down to you're uh, distorting your reverb or you're putting reverb on your distortion kind of thing, right? If it's in front of the, if it's in front of the amp. Obviously, the signal is the dry signal gets reverb on it, and then it gets processed through the amplifier. If you're running any kind of overdrive, then the the uh, overdrive uh, is being placed onto the reverb rather than the other way around. You're just adding reverb to the already overdriven signal. The uh, if you're running clean, it I don't think it matters too much. No, I haven't noticed clean. too big of a difference. Yeah, clean, I don't notice. Me, I, I have, uh, for dirty, clean, it's fine. Delay and reverb before the preamp section on a clean amp, I yeah. care less. Um, the, uh, with a, before overdrive though, on the amp, reverb is a no-go for me ever. And delay, when done right, sounds fantastic because that's how like a lot of people like Eddie Van Halen does it. Sure. Uh, the old school stuff before there were effects loops. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a lot of these guys ran their delay pedals right in to the front end of their Marshall. You know what I mean? And um, and I kind of, I first, the first time I've ever done that, being a person who's always used delay in the effects loop, and then one day you try it because you sure. heard they did it, and you're like, this is a nightmare. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 there is a learning curve to yeah. finding that sweet spot because it literally goes from to horrible to barely usable to finally like, okay, yeah, yeah, I can see why they were using this. Yeah. Um, and then also it's not just gain, it's how much gain, like if you're running 5150, you know, PV 5150 high gain. Yeah. It's like, I, you can, it seems really hard to get that delay in front of that signal. But what's great about that is I've never come across an amp that has that kind of gain that didn't have an effects loop. Right. So right. you shouldn't be in that situation, hopefully. So, um, where else? What else we got? Um, there are. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go back. Find a couple of your questions. What do you have? Can you? This is a crazy question. Yash thirteen thirty one says, "Can you tell stock setup configuration of a PRSSE single cut?" I can't even find that guitar on their website. Can I tell stock the stock setup, setup configuration? Huh? I don't really think I understand the question. I think are you saying can I detect if you if you were playing it and it had all the stock hardware on it? Could I tell? Um, no, because I don't think that's how stuff works. I don't think you go, oh yeah, that's a that's a type of pickup. That's a type of guitar. Right. Uh, you know, you just kind of hear tonalities and then you know what kind of equipment li li leads to that kind of sound. So, okay, what else do we got? I guess I have a lot of good questions, so I want to hit them real quick. Um, all right. Daniel says, oh, no. See, you guys are answering each other's questions, which is good. You're going to make this easy. Let's see what Enrico says. Enrico. Enrico says, happy birthday. Thank you. How do you wire an HSS Strat for three volumes, no tone, and a five-way? The five-way is my roadblock. Just looking standard switch on the five way so what you want to do is you you want to have just three volume knobs one for each pickup that's very easy to do so and you have no tone controls all you do is you're gonna all your grounds to your uh doesn't matter let's say the first volume knob that's easy right your three hots each pickup will go to its individual 
volume pot, right? And then the output of those volume pots will go to the switch, and then the output of the switch will go to the output jack. Yep. And uh, I know it's hard to kind of answer that question without a diagram, but you understand it's the same way it's it's wired up normally. You're just going to the the volume pot. So uh, that's how. Think of this, and this make it easy for you. Um, the fastest, besides looking up and trying to find a schematic like that, the fastest, easiest schematic is a less pulse schematic where the pickups go to the volume pots and then those volume pots go to the three-way switch. Right. This would work the same way, just you would say from the volume pots, you want to go to the five-way switch the same way it would normally work. So you just, all you need is a Gibson less, a less pulse schematic and a Strat schematic. And if you look at them side by side, take what you want from each one. That's right. It should work. It will, yeah, it, it'll it'll work. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that'll work. Um, and that's a good starting point. So let me know how that goes. If not, I'm sure I can find something to help you a little bit along the way. They um, You know, the sad part is there used to be so much better schematics to find online, especially through Seymour Duncan. And Seymour Duncan changed a few years ago, I think, in an attempt to make things easier. But it made it harder for you, I think, to find all the schematics. Um, but there's some really great resources online for schematics and i'll put one when i index this later a good resource to find and just find all those schematics but the best thing to do with guitars here's some good advice for when starting out wiring guitars find schematics different ones and just realize that you can take ideas from one and apply them to another sure yeah yeah right? yeah. yeah um and so if you what you're doing isn't ever going to be truly unique unfortunately no one you know one's thinking up a new way to wire up a guitar at this point. Um, not, you know, right. It's pretty much all been done. Yeah, it's all been done, which is good for you because even if you come up with a totally new idea, it's really just going to be one step away from a variation that already exists. So you should be able to do that. And then says, uh, this one's from Frank. It says, hey, Phil, uh, would love to see you try out a KSR amp on the show, both his cabs and amps our top notch. Uh, Kyle, the builder is an amazing dude. I thought KSR was turned into rev amps. Do I not understand that correctly? Why do I think that? No, I think Rhodes amps turn into rev amps. So KSR amps. All right. I'll put a link to KSR amps. Um, maybe I can do a reach out to them. I'm not sure. Uh, I've seen the brand before. I'm just not familiar with where I've seen it. Have you ever heard of KSR amps? I haven't. I haven't. The... See, I would think you, you know, you, you know, all you builders just talk <laughs> at some point. We do probably more than most people realize, but I don't know that it crosses over pedal builders to amp builders. I think the amp builders talk to the amp builders and the pedal builders talk to the pedal builders and the guitar builders talk to the guitar builders. Yeah, that's funny. I would picture it the same way, but you think you, you think you would get. I don't know. See, to me, I think if I reached out like an amp builder to a pedal builder, or amp builder to guitar builder or whatever, vice versa. You might come up with an idea that's crazy. It's true. I, I, I agree. That kind of that kind of crossing over, I think, would would bring new ideas uh, in, into the fold. But I think when you st when you start talking to someone who's not in your field, they automatically think that you're after something else. I think, right? Yeah. Yeah, that I've been privy to. I've been in those kind of meetings with companies. And yeah, yeah, they don't they don't like to share sometimes. Right, right. That's so. It's it's kind of strange. You kind of have to get to know them a little bit, and so so they feel comfortable with you before you start. Talking this next them. message or this next one's from. Sorry about that. Cario. K, how do I say that? Cario. The problem I'm having is the the screen is smaller than normal. He says, "Hey Phil, what's the most efficient way to find the right tone EQ settings?" On my bass amp, I have a Fender Rumble. Uh, me, the fastest, most bass players especially, and it kind of leans into guitar players too. To me, run the EQ flat. Everything's straight up twelve o'clock. Yeah, noon. Yeah, noon. Uh, to me, that's the fastest way to figure out what your bass sounds like. So whether your bass is active or passive, whether it has an EQ or not, um, you know, you set that, and now, now you're to me in my mind, you're listening to your bass. The amp is really putting little effect on the tone of the bass, the actual instrument. And then you start messing with that. Um, it's real common, so you know, for bass players to run everything flat anyways. Sure. You know what I mean? The the reason being is it's a good idea if you can great if you can get a great tone that way, here's why. Because as bass players will 
probably att attest to this as well. A lot of the EQ on a bass amp has to do with the room, not the amp. Does that make sense? Sure. So if I can set up my sound on my bass, that's why a lot of us like active preamps. You set up a tone you like, sure. you run the bass kind of flat, the bass amp flat, and then you're in a room one day and all of a sudden you're just not getting any volume, no, no low end frequency. Well, now you're going to add the bass. You know what I mean? Or the room is sucking up all the high. You know what I mean? You're not getting clarity in your tone. You run the highs a little bit. So in the mids. So I, I tend to think of a bass amp as, and a guitar amp does this too, I think to some degree. I, I, I want the EQ to be, to solve the problem of the room I'm going to be in when I'm playing versus setting up this perfect tone. Because I think if you're going to, I think to me, when I think of setting up the perfect EQ set, that's that's the perfect failure because once I'm in a room that isn't where that EQ is set, to change anyway. Yes, um, the uh, one of my favorite things to do if you're new to guitar or our bass and you're messing with amps is uh, just take your amplifier for fun. And uh, normally, all of us do the same thing at home. Uh, you put it against the wall. Band practice too. You put sure. it against the wall, and and then you set it up and then i tell everybody go just pick it up and put it sideways so that one of the sides of the amp is facing the wall and watch everything go to right yeah it's <laughs> completely different yeah just moving the amp around even a bass amp or guitar amp moving a ramp around so um that's the first thing you notice that's why you notice uh, musicians that that tour have all these kind of solutions for that pro same very same problem do you have any so you have suggestions for that um no, most most bases with active pickups have such great uh, EQ control on the bass that you know you can. I, I agree with you. Running the the EQ on the bass amp flat, run it everything at noon, and just start there and EQ to the room. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarang says happy birthday. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I'm saying the name wrong. I'm just trying to read it off the screen. It says Phil, what do you think about Strandberg guitars? Uh, also, do you think they are fair, pr fairly priced? Uh, they're Chinese made and start at 1200 bucks. Well, I have a good friend who plays Strandberg uh, guitars. He has one of the American ones, uh, not the real ones. No, no, the American ones are the, he has a ghost built one from Washburn. So the Strandberg guitars in the U.S. were built by Strictly 7 as a ghost builder. I'll tell you the story so you can hear it like them. And then it moved from Strictly 7 to Washburn, which is Washburn Parker. And now it's the Fano guys, which local here in town, sure, uh, ghost now. built them. Yeah. Um, because Strandberg guitars are made, I, I'm not versed heavily in them, so please understand. I don't know where the original builder builds them, the Strandberg guy, but he builds them and then he has them ghost built in the USA. Is like a, that's the mid high end line. Those are three to five grand, I think, because I think the ones actually made by Strandberg are pretty crazy priced. Um, my buddy, there's some reason I'm telling you that is my buddy has one of the three, $4,000 ones that you buy in the U S and then he has one of the main Korea ones that were 1500 bucks. I wasn't aware they had a Chinese one, so we could be talking about the same thing. The 12, $1,500 ones could be the Korean ones, sure. or they could have right. a new line of $1,200 Chinese ones. And I just haven't seen about it yet. So that I couldn't attest to, but I know this, he really likes his Korean made one as much as his American one, which is uh, an impressive thing, you know, to be said. Um, and, uh, but part of that also is that his Korean made one has been modernized. In other words, Strandberg has made some, uh, adjustments to the instrument over the few years, uh, fixing some of the issues, which is like some of the bridges were hard to turn the, the tuners and right. stuff. I mean, um, he had, he had the American one he had, I, I used to hate it so much. I used to love playing it, but tuning it, if you had to tune it, I would tear the skin off my fingers trying to turn that those screws because they were so hard and they're so so hard to grab get a grab on um and uh so he he likes the korean one a lot as for as fairly priced i think the the part of the problem always with fairly priced is tough because you have two factors you have uh made in china which is implies that it's going to be a lower price point but to a company a lot of times regardless of what it costs to make they're going to use an adage that says it's it's 10 grand and when we make an import, it's like three grand. And to us, like three grand for the import is insane. But they're like, well, it's three grand or 10 grand. Right. You know, that's how they look at it. And, and the reason is, is they have to factor in something that's really important, which is if they make the price too cheap, then they lose the high end sales. Now, I'm not saying that's what happens. I'm saying what this is what they say happens. So I, I don't know. What I do feel like, me personally, 
is as much as I like them and they have a unique neck, I think a lot of people are probably, that's why it's probably Kiesel's doing so well right now. Because that, to me, when you think $1,200 to $1,500, you can buy Kiesel uh, style, not the Vader, what's the other, the, uh, the one with the O, oh, the Osiren. You can buy the Osiren, which is, doesn't have the, uh, what's the neck called? Oh, I feel horrible now. The Strandberg neck. It's called the, somebody's going to say in the comments, hopefully. It's got the crazy net name of the neck. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Uh, you know what's funny? This is going to date my age for my birthday. When I think of the neck, I always think of the OptiGrab. Oh, right. For those of you guys who remember the movie The Jerk, he invented the OptiGrab, which was a thing for his glasses, uh, Steve Martin. And so the neck has a funny name, and I always think of the neck as the OptiGrab because it has a strange name to the neck. Uh, uh, you know, I want to say asymmetrical, but asymmetrical is, I think, is something else, right? So anyways, uh, so that all being said, you have to decide for yourself if it's worth the money for you. But uh, the good news is if you don't want to pay that kind of money for a made in China or import guitar, there are Kiesels. There are price out there and my understanding is there's i've seen knockoff strandbergs made in china uh online uh knockoffs in the idea that they're not labeled strandberg but that style of guitar for the two three hundred dollar uh, price point so there's always stuff to check out there's always there's always some product out there at every price point that can make you feel comfortable me personally if i'm not comfortable paying twelve hundred dollars for an import guitar I, I just abstain from it yeah so uh Let's see. Uh, so Incafish23 says, Lawrence Petros, thanks for supporting Phil. Best surf reverb. Mm. I don't know. That might be my weak spot. Uh, I don't know. I'm stumped. Okay. So let me help you out. Help. Because... Cause he's more tech minded than just buying crap minded. Like, like I am like, I just need to get stuff. Uh, to me, like the ultimate surf reverb is the 63 spring reverb by Fender, the actual tube spring reverb. Sure. Right. Sure. So it's like, so it's to me, it's like, okay, that's like, to me, if somebody said ultimate British rock sound, right. Right. You're thinking Marshall of Vox right away. Right. Right. And then depending on the era of the time, you know, it's what, you know, it's like, it's like, if it's queen, it's the Vox. And if it's ACDC, it's the Marshall. To me, when I think surf rock, uh, surf music, uh, uh, I think in, you know, obviously uh, the Ventures and Dick Dale and stuff, right? right? When I think of those people, 63 Spring Reaver, right. you know, from Fender, right? So then it's who does, for th those that don't want a giant $600 Spring Reaver, <laughs> which who wouldn't want that, right? Uh, uh, then it's who makes the best knockoff, and um, it's this one. Yeah. But here's what you can – you guys, I want to tell you guys a story uh, that maybe you can help me with because you guys were great. So last week I mentioned that I wanted to give away some Dava picks, and uh, and you guys reached out to Dava and said, hey, I buy picks because of Phil McKnight. And Dava contacted me, so you know. And what I ended up doing with Dava was I bought a case of picks for myself personally. I paid I paid for them. They gave me a really good deal on them. Um, and then they gave me a case to give away. Nice. So I have, yeah, so I have picks to give away. Really what they did is they just sold me two cases really, really cheap. But the way I like to think of it is I bought mine low price and I've got some to give away. Um, so uh, because I didn't want them to give me picks, I offered to pay for picks and that's the, the thing. So the reason I mentioned that is I reached out to TC, uh, tour at TC, and I told TC I have this great idea. I would like to make a tone print for the Hall of Fame of this 63 Spring Reverb pedal. And he said, well, that'd be great, but we don't have that pedal. And I'm like, I'll, I'll ship you mine and let you borrow it. And I would even be willing to, uh, you know, because tone prints are easy. They can just email me. You know what I mean? We right. can just send them back and forth. So if you guys think that's something interesting, put that in the comments down below that you would be interested in a, because uh, it would probably be me. It'd be the, just like I have the Nerd Whammy tone print. It would right. be the Phil McKnight 63 Spring tone print. I, I don't mind putting the time. So you understand. So very, very clear. That would be a lot of hours of my time. Literally, I get nothing for the tone prints. They're free to you, so they don't pay you right. for developing them. But I would really like to, I would, and I also offer TC to do the video where I compare the tone print. That'd be to, cool. So that you guys don't have to buy a $200, $300 used pedal because that's my problem with this pedal right now is that it's, 
you know, it's they're pricey. they're pricey because they don't make them anymore. And of course, once you stop making something, and I'm sure you could find this a version of this pedal somewhere out there. But uh, so that's just a suggestion for that. Hope hope that kind of puts you in the right direction. Um, Robert says you mentioned Explore shirts on on the pic I posted to the Facebook. I did. Yes. Uh, thank you for that po uh, picture, by the way. Uh, any news? P.S. I like the black and white checkered pic you sent. Uh, great. Great. Uh, yeah, the Explore. So what's going to happen is uh, I talk to my wife does those. Uh, SG is going to be next and then Explore is after that. So that's the two. Currently this month for the month of July, it's the Jazzmaster Jaguar. So if you guys are interested in that shirt, it goes away in four days. So ish, she always runs them a couple days later because you know what I mean? But if you're interested in that version of the shirt, I'll put a link in the description down below. And then uh, she's working on uh, uh, August and September to be the, the SG and the Explorer. Those are highly requested versions of the shirt. Like I said, eventually we'll get to, I know everybody sends me emails. I appreciate that. You guys are awesome with, hey, I would really like this shirt. Um, but keep in mind, we'll get to them all. She's she's literally making all the the guitar because again, we know that that's something that it's just personal. And I, and what I like about it is because I get to see the 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 purchases. Yeah, you know the sales. Sometimes I, I'll look and I go, wow, of that mo of that style shirt, we sold seven. You know what I mean? And I go, well, the odds are you're never going to bump into another dude with your shirt. Right. <laughs> you know right? what I mean? So uh, very so, unique. Yeah, and and what's great is as she creates shirts, um, she'll be able to slowly be able to accommodate everybody so uh, but thank you again for mentioning that i want to know if we can have a a slight variation on the sg shirt that has the uh the guy at the right with a schoolboy's outfit on oh nice <laughs> yeah that would be nice well you know somebody uh me and ralph were talking about the duck walk making yeah. sure the guy yeah. that does the duck walk does it because we have the duck walk guy um so we'll see the other thing that might happen too, so you guys know on shirts, is we had an interesting thing happen uh, just recently with shirts, and then I promise to get back to guitar stuff, um, which was the patrons, the the top tier patrons. Um, what happens is when they hit a hundred dollars, they get a custom shirt, right? And the custom shirt is, uh, you know, they they she gives you a list of stuff to choose from and you go, okay, this kind of guitar, this color, and they change them. Nice. And uh, we recently had somebody do the gold top shirt, which was Justin Mabe. And, uh, and what happened was everybody loves that shirt. So we got to figure out what to do for, for Justin now, because I bought one, I'm wearing it to the event tomorrow. <laughs> I showed you, right? Right. But, yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, everybody loves that shirt. Cause it's such a cool idea. It's just a gold top yeah. Les Paul. Looks great. Uh, I put it on the end of the, uh, the uh, Eastwood video. The, the logo just because I, I liked it so much. So eventually we get to all that kind of stuff. That's the whole point. Just whatever you guys suggestion, just keep in mind, whatever you guys are suggestion, suggesting, it doesn't get forgotten, right? She's she's literally creating all this stuff. We have, and we have a way, and sometimes you get lucky, you suggest something crazy and she'll email you back and say, I actually have that shirt. Would you like it? Uh, I had that happen a couple weeks ago. Somebody sent me out of nowhere. They wanted Ivan his gym shirt. And uh, Bradulus, one of the patrons had a gym shirt made for him special. And so she's like, I actually have that guitar. What would you like? And he, they said, and then she's like, okay, we can figure something out. So she works cool. out. So it was kind of, cool. it was cool. It was good to see. Cause it was, it was for a, a good reason, a good cause too. Okay. So let's go back to the main page. So <laughs> Sergeant power when he says, don't do an SG shirt without the duck walk guy. Yes. So, uh, yes. Uh, he, so here's, and then I, I want to also tell you this and then we'll, we're done with the shirts. <laughs> we're talking about the shirts. Uh, the other thing is now the shirt company that I use, I switched. I think I, I told you guys this before, but I like to reiterate it again. The, I used to have all these different versions of shirts and you could buy without doing the monthly thing. You could just buy any shirt you wanted. It was great. You know, right? everybody loved it except for everybody get, kept getting shipped the wrong shirts because the shirt company, was, wasn't looking at the logos they were shipping. They would just ship. So if you ordered a Les Paul, you would get a Strat. And if you ordered a Strat, they'd send you a Telly because they weren't even looking. They were just printing whatever. So this new company, we've tested them many times now for, with you guys, and we've had great uh, luck. No one seems to be sent the wrong guitar yet. Uh, so, cause to them, it just looks like a guitar on right. a logo. They don't notice that it's somehow <laughs> different. Um, so there you go. <laughs> yeah, air guitars. Ben, ben Galvin's like, what about air, air guitar shirts? I'm up for that. Um, 
Okay, so the next one is Eddie. He says, just picked up the Fuchs, the new Fuchs 50 watt ODS classic. Amazing amp. Anyone else give a... Uh, uh, <laughs> give a Fook. <laughs> give a Fook. Uh, uh, Fuchs makes amazing stuff. You ever played it? Uh, I played some of their older stuff. I haven't played any of the new stuff. But yeah, they're, they're, the the uh, this was the original stuff. They went through some management changes i think yeah mid, midpoint but i think they have it back now i don't i don't know the exact story but the one that i played was phenomenally good yeah it was really good i don't i've played two or three and and they to me remind me of like and not the same style of amp but it's like wizard amps like oh you know what i mean you play sure. them and you go oh yeah this is yeah. nice i see why they're getting that money a lot of went into yeah. it yeah <laughs> yes and um and and that's and that's one of those things there's a lot of amp companies like them that just they they make everything uh, right. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm glad to see now is, you know, for me, it was always the same problem though. It was always, uh, the, the guys that made the great amps, the hand wired, you know, great amps, they made loud amps. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, even companies like car C A R R. I had a car Mercury amp and that was one of my, probably my favorite amps. Uh, and, um, and it was eight Watts, but it only sounded good. It dimed. dimed. Yeah. And you're like, and and it's like, and, and eight watts dined at the house. It's crazy loud. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like, a, okay, everybody left this Saturday. Let's give it a shot. And then, so, so yeah. Sometimes it would be nice of a lot of the. I like the idea that a lot of these boutique guys are starting to make smaller amps for the right. bedroom players and yeah. the studio players because let's be honest, you know, I, I I'm just I I it's it's been. I gig uh I gig and play with friends as much as I can, but I have it's. I, I think it's been probably 20 years. It feels like 10, but probably 20 uh, years since I've needed to be loud. Right. Like since anyone's ever told me to turn up. No one's, in fact, no one's ever told me to turn up never, ever. Never. <laughs> never once in my life. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and so uh, because of that, I, I don't ever feel like, you know, everybody's like, is it loud enough for a gig? I'm like, I, you know, I've literally never been told to turn up. Uh, so uh, not even by the drummer. Yeah. No, nobody. Right. So, uh, you know, there you go. Uh, Sergeant flying V says EVH products, overall opinion. I like them. Uh, I've owned many of them. Uh, and I think they are, are, are definitely great stuff. I have the guitars. I like their guitars. I have their amps. I like their amps. Uh, have the pedals. It, and I have their pedals, even though the pedals are MXR, uh, and I like the pedals. So good stuff. You know, Eddie's got a great ear. That's what he brings to the yeah. table. To me, it's like there's there's a ton of great players. Don't get me wrong. But to me, it's Eddie Van Halen and Billy Gibbons and the idea that whenever a product comes out that has their their ear, you know, and that's what those products are. It's like it's like those guys go, no, 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 no. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah. Make and that. Make, make that. that. And then and then you play it and you go, this is great. And a lot of people, are, if they don't like those products, well, then maybe you don't like Eddie's vision sure. of tone. And, um, or a lot of times I think with EVH products for me personally, talking to, to friends and, and people is it's a perception thing. They, they don't think it sounds like the Eddie Van Halen sound. And I go, well, sometimes he's not creating his sound. He's creating a sound he wants. Uh, I was at a thing where he was talking once personally and he said he he's, you know, he's sometimes he's bored with his sound. He's trying to create a new sound. Uh, he could have been just saying that, but I thought it was an interesting idea. Sure. You know, like, Hey, who wants to create? Sure. And his sound uh, evolved throughout his entire career anyway. So right. yes. Yeah. Yeah. To me, it's like, to me, uh, you know, not only the Roth versus Hagar tone, but then there's like two stages of the Hagar tone. Right. Cause definitely once the, you know, once it gets into the, the PV for unlawful carnal knowledge sound, the PV sound, right. That's that, fuzzier thicker tone with more saturation that uh it, that i notice a lot of players hate the problem is everything about tone is i use this analogy uh i've used it with you before too i call it mother's cooking mom's cooking right, right? You, you you and i grew up different moms creating food differently we can have lunch together we could have different opinions about the same meal based on that sure my mom used to always put this in it. Yeah. And so this is not very good because it doesn't have that. And your mom used to not put that in it. And that's why that meal is good. Right. Uh, I find the same thing happens with uh, sound. You sure. know, people listen to sound and they go, uh, you know, this sounds good because I grew up listening to that. This sounds bad because, 
you know, I don't like that. You know, it doesn't sound like how I want it to sound. Right. My problem is my very first Van Halen album was for unlawful carnal knowledge. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, because here's the here's the math that makes sense. They took a hiatus, right? It wasn't like uh, I always want to Google it, but I'm doing off memories. Like they 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 went dormant for like six years, right? They did OU812, and then they they don't do anything. Like that's like 86, and yeah, then from 86 like 91 or something like that, right? They don't do it. anything. So if you guys are doing the math with me, let me tell you how that works out for me. Van Halen doesn't make an album for my junior high and part of my high school year. You know what I mean? So like for a gap. Uh, so when I got into music, Van Halen wasn't making music. Right. And then all of a sudden, Foreign Lawful Carnal Knowledge comes out with the drill. And I was like, oh, a drill. That's just cool. Because, you know, a drill. Even though I've seen Paul Gilbert do it better. But <laughs> but you, you get the idea. So people get upset. I think it's funny when music, music fans get upset that I say this stuff. But I'm like, you understand. I'm just saying because that's that. To me, that's the first Van Halen I sure, hear. That's your reference. Yeah, <clears throat> because actually the very first Van Halen I ever heard, which isn't Van Halen, was Sky, uh, Skyscraper, which David Roth and Vi. Right. Yankee Rose, is that on right. Skyscraper? Yeah. Uh, no, that's on uh, uh, Eat Him and Smile. Smile. Okay, so Eat Him and Smile. So literally Yankee Rose is me, when I'm thinking, like the three moments I remember as a kid on MTV, obviously Beat It by Michael Jackson, yeah. um, the, uh, uh, the Yankee Rose video. Yeah and uh cindy lopper right yeah like girls the, just want to have fun yeah. yeah so that's the stuff you saw right. and boy george and stuff sure. right you saw all that stuff and then the first time i saw steve i and he's like talking with his guitar i was like oh that guy's good and then when i saw then somebody's like oh you think that guy's good listen to van halen and you listen to van halen I'm like yeah that's good but he doesn't make his guitar talk like that other guy right uh <laughs> and uh and um you know you get the idea so the uh what's your first van halen moment what's the first van halen you've listened to um it was uh van halen 2 um i think it was um either light up the sky or somebody get me a doctor i was over to friend's house and he's like have you heard van halen i'm like i don't who they played for me and it was like and it's funny because my initial reaction was these guys suck because i wasn't into dave's voice right and then uh, I didn't hear it again for about six months. And then I actually heard Van Halen one, which is the same. And it's like, yeah, but the guitar playing was like so cool. I was like, all right, I have to listen to it. But, right. Right. But I still had a hard time with it, with the vocals. Um, but it grew on me like Dave grows on just about everybody. So, and, and then I just, then I picked up the whole catalog after that. See? Yeah. Um, okay. Next one is, from Sam, he says, I have a late 90s PV Classic 50 212. Should I upgrade the old Blue Marvel speakers? What's well, a good replacement? Celestian Creambacks. I like the Blue Marvel speakers. Um, you know, when I was in uh, New Jersey and I was at the Tone King's house, I got to play his classic 30 head through his 212 cabinet with Blue Marvels. And I was in love and he wouldn't sell me the amp. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, I... I I've been looking online. I have not found uh, there's a classic 30 head. There was like one in Poland or something like that. And I was like thinking about, Oh my goodness, if it ships it all the way here, you know what I mean? It's like some stuff doesn't even make it just a state away. Right. Um, so you could change it. I, I, I can't give you a, a great suggestion because I actually like those amp, uh, those speakers. I can tell you the cream backs. I have the Neo cream back and I've been messing with, it. I put in three different amps now. Uh, and it, oh, it's okay. I, I haven't found the, the love of that speaker yet. Um, so, you know, if, but if you guys have suggestions, stuff like that, this is a good time to say, hey, I've had the hamp, I've changed it to the speaker. Speakers are definitely can get expensive messing around with. Um, and you do exactly what you're doing. You know, ask around for a good suggestion and best educated guess. Um, but I, I like selections too, by the way. So you, you can't go wrong there. Uh, Ice Pick 19 says, happy birthday, Phil. Thank you, Ice Pick. Says, where can I get an LPD shirt? Also, uh also make a kyg gretch billy duffy falcon shirt so the first one goes to you where do you get an lpd shirt um I, they are available on t chip pro i think it's uh t chip pro off or, so yeah if you can put off, the link off of the link and put it in the index for this part um so you can get one i have one but he gave it to me so caught me unprepared <laughs> yeah um, and then also uh, Gretsch Billy Duffy uh, Falcon shirt. Yeah, you know what? 
I can tell you right now, uh, when when we get to a a, a Gretsch uh, shirt, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a Falcon. Yeah, yeah. Um, the next one is from Fias fifty five uh, five 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 says Fishman Fluence, and then there's no uh, probably you're asking me what my thoughts on them. Man, Robert Baker, ton of ton of players have put them in their guitars. Everybody seems to love them. Uh, I think um, doesn't Tosin Abasi put them in the? Uh, yeah, he does. He puts them in the uh, the uh, Tosin the Abasi guitars. Um, I've heard nothing but good things. Uh, I'd have to get a set and put them in a guitar. I've said this before in a video. I just haven't got a set to install yet. Uh, you know, it's one of those things like on a sharpen my axe. I thought, well, maybe you know what I mean. If the guitar sure. called for it, maybe we do that. Um, but I haven't got there, but we, but, but maybe that's going to change soon. We'll see tomorrow with the restring event. You're going to see some change. You're going to see some stuff coming. The restring event tomorrow is not just a thank you to you guys and me doing work, but it's also a way for me to communicate with you in real world instead of just this verbal back and forth where I have guitars, I have situations. Maybe I can find a situation and go, okay, yeah, this is a guitar to sharpen or that, you know, helps me go, okay, that's a problem. I, to me, if I hear you guys say something over and over again, I do 20 restrings in a row and I hear 10 things over and over again, I go, okay, that's a video I need to right. make. That's a great sharp my axe video. Because again, I, I don't want to just take guitars and fix them up. I want each one to be a video where you hopefully get entertained for 15, 20 minutes. That's all I'm trying to entertain you. That's all just trying to entertain you. But hopefully at the end of the 15, 20 minutes, you're like, Hey, I learned that. Or I saw the thing I didn't know happened, right? You learn one piece of information, maybe two pieces of information, but you had a good time. That to me is a win. It's like back to guys. You guys remember the great teachers you had back in school, the ones that made the hour go by fast because they were entertaining and you, and you always go, man, I learned something new every time. That's, that's all my videos I'm trying to do. I'm trying to be that teacher that you love to, to go to that class um, where I can hopefully have some fun and teach something. Um, this is for both of us. Favorite mini guitar pedal? Well, mine's obviously going to be the the Mini 68, but they don't exist any longer. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, I have one because I've got the original one that I built. But oh, uh, yeah. other than that, you know, I have to say I really like the um, the IR, the Mini IR pedal. What's oh, that? oh yeah. What's uh, that one? It's uh, this one. This one? Yes. Yeah, the more. Yeah. That pedal. Great pedal. So the, yeah, this is a sick pedal. Yeah. I use this on videos from time to time. This is the uh the uh, impulse response pedal by more. Uh I, I like it very much so uh for you guys. Uh this is not my favorite mini pedal. My favorite mini pedal has got to be the Ditto Mini. Um, just because there's so many great mini pedals, but that's a mini pedal that I like. I have I have two or three of them for different boards and stuff. So the mini looper, in fact, I can't grab one off the shelf because they're all on boards. Uh, so ditto mini for me, for sure. Um, and those are two obscure mini pedals. For yes. the rest. Probably the last answer you ever thought you were going to get. <laughs> Considering I've said a million times, I only like overdrive pedals and you make overdrive pedals. Yeah. And both was like, yeah, not, a, not an overdrive pedal. Um, let's see. What else do we got? Oh, do we? Which one? Uh, a little further down. I think there's a couple down here that we haven't got to. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So Alizar says, what do you think will bring rock back to the radio? I, I, the last guy to ask, I don't listen to the radio. Yeah. Uh, I listen to Spotify. So, um, in fact, uh, uh, I've, <laughs> uh, I used to take the antenna out of the truck. And throw it behind the seat because I, it just hated the fact that every time you go to a car wash, you got to take it off. Sure, so I take it off, and my wife and son would both get upset with me when they get in. They're like, "Hey, you got to put the stupid thing in for the radio." I'm like, "I don't listen. I don't listen to the radio." <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I don't listen to the radio. Uh, but in that reference, uh, what would bring rock back? I don't think rock's gone anywhere. No, yeah. there's still stations out there that play it. But as far as like being a popular genre on the radio, time is the only thing that's going to bring rock back to that. This is another. Another interesting point uh, that I think is fun to talk about when it comes to rock and metal, especially rock and metal. And people talk about rock and metal being dead. I was in the metal when I was in high school. So right now, I'm sure a lot of you are like, yeah, me too. Except for here's the difference. That was totally not cool. 
rap was definitely cool when I was in high school. Uh, you know what I mean? In fact, everything was cool except for what I listened to. No one was listening to rock and metal. No one. And 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 uh, when I went to high school, it was like uh, rap was huge. Uh, pop music, of course, was huge because uh, that was always huge. Then there was, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, you know Nine Inch Nails and all that stuff, right. and, and industrial, and, industrial, and then the uh, what's the other stuff? Uh, not the independent music, but what they called it uh, um, something to what's like a Jane's Addiction? What do you call that? Uh, is that alternative? Alternative. alternative, alternative, alternative music and stuff. Even that stuff was slightly more popular than metal rock. So to me, rock and metal um, have had their moments in time where they were mainstream and pop music. Elvis, the Beatles, Van Halen Kiss, right? Sure. Mainstream rock music. But I think as a whole, because here's what's funny. You look at numbers, like look at Avenged Sevenfold. I like Avenged Sevenfold a lot. And I've seen them three times live. And what's funny about them, if you look at their numbers, their album sales, their concert stuff, they're killing. They do great. But they're, they are they don't even register on the real world. Right. A, like, you're not going to see the guys at Vince Sevenfold show up to Ellen DeGeneres. <laughs> hey, hey, everybody, it's Ellen here. We have a Vince Sevenfold. This is Zachy Vengeance and Sinister Gates and M Shadows, right? Like, th that's not going to happen. So I think th the sad thing is it's just, it's not that it's not that rock or metal needs to come back. It's just it, it hasn't been a pop music for a while and it probably won't be for a while and i'm okay with that there's enough fans for me to hang out with and talk about sure. rock music yeah, absolutely so um so if that if that's any uh j van this one's j van 231 says just saying hey to you guys hey j van hey can't wait for an lpd dumble pedal what about a dumble pedal secret secret can't say can't say I can tell you this. I have the I have two dumbbell like pedals. I have the Zen Drive, which is mm -hmm. I think that's like the is that the Holy Grail dumbbell mm -hmm. pedal? It's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, like in the idea that it's like that's what it's that's for. what he was going for. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I have a I have a Zen Drive that's signed by him, uh Hermedia, whatever, before you know he he sent it over to uh, Love Pedals. He had a stroke or something, or something happened. Something bad happened. But so that, and then I have the overrated special by Way Huge, which was, you know, ha, the overdrive special, the overrated special, overrated special. And I like the 68 more than those. In fact, I'm going to sell my Zen Drive. I, I just need to put it on reverb because they're going for top dollar. So it's funny to me. I would never say the 68 is a Dumble drive, but it does what I like Dumble drive pedals do, which is give me a very light overdrive that's not, there's no fizz. To me, when I think of Dumbles, I have no idea what Dumble is. <laughs> is a tone because i've never really played a real dumble um you know i made that joke a million times right i've i've played the all the clones of dumbles and if any of the clones have taught me anything that apparently there is a sound i guess but you know and then uh, what did somebody say uh that there is no dumble sound because every dumble was made differently. differently yeah yeah right but i think people kind of focus on i think for me everybody's different because obviously santana has a dumble sure and, uh, tremani's got a dumble but yeah. when i think dumble i think slang wise I think we're all, a lot of us are talking about Robin Ford. Robin Ford or Larry Carlton, I think, are the two that most people yeah. go after the most. So I think it's funny, like the Dumble sound is sometimes like the Robin Ford sound. Yeah. Which for me, I found from Joe Bonamassa. I, I, I heard Joe Bonamassa the first time and I go, that, that, that cat's good, man. And then he's like, oh, I like Robin Ford and Eric Johnson. Eric Johnson. I'm like, oh, I know who Eric Johnson is. Who's Robin Ford? Right. And then I found Robin Ford. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. This is the guy. Yeah. I'm in love with this now. Um. And uh, so I, so I, he's not going to say it because it's his company. He can't say it. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, uh, try the 68 drive for that. You'll love it. In fact, you'll love it more. I like it more than those pedals. Or it, you can buy my Zen drive off me when I put it on a reverb for, I think it's like they're going for like 350 or some stupid amount of money. Um, maybe more. Um, uh, next one is Kevin. Kevin says Mesa F100 212 combo. Thoughts? You ever played that one? I think I did play that. That's the formula, right? Yep. Um, they they've got to be what fifteen years old now. Yeah. Is that about something like that? They were they were good. It was a two channel. I think one of them was one of the one of the channels was supposed to be the rectifier esque right. Right. channel, and then uh, then there was another that was like the clean clean crunch thing. I thought they were pretty good. They did. I don't think they hit as big as Boogie was hoping they would. No. 
but it falls to me in another category where there's a learning curve on the controls because mm. more travel means more gain. Right. 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 And, uh, but the other thing is like a lot of the maces, uh, that I, uh, maces, a lot of Mesa boogie stuff literally took the market, uh, came into the market and did really well because they were great at just what everybody needed, which is something that was loud right. and took over, you know, gave you a full sound. And so to me, like I said, sometimes I'm not the right answer, guy to ask about that because to me, it's like that F100 212 is loud. Very loud. Yeah. So I'm like, to me, it's like, yeah, that's great. You go, you go to a gig and a guy's got a Marshall half stack and you're like, Hey, I get to play with you with my 212s and we're going to have fun together tonight. Uh, but if you're trying to use it at, at, at home for regular band, small band practice and, you know, you're going to have to front it with some kind of pedals or something because otherwise to get to me, to, and the reason I say that is this Mesa's uh, when a lot of people tell me Mesa's are really fizzy and they don't like that fizz. That to me is something that happens until the amps loud. Sure. When they're quiet. Yeah. 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 And then all of a sudden as the Mesa's get louder to me, there's like two Mesa sounds, right? There's the Mesa fizz, which is yep. the lower sound. That's the, to me, that's the preamp section. Right. And then as you turn them up, then there's the fuller, less fizzy, yeah, they Pop. open up and and yeah, start breathing fire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when when people tell me they hate the rectoverb, that's a problem I have. So you guys know this is a problem I have with rectoverb pedals. They sound like the quiet sound. Right? Yeah, they sound like the quiet sound. They they go after the Mesa recto sound I don't like, which is the fizzier, you know, sound. I like the more. I mean, it's like angry. It's yeah. like a, a Godzilla screaming in your face recto rectifier sound. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and the other thing about Mesa's too is if you, and this is my last point, just cause we're talking about Mesa boogies. It's something I learned uh, very early on with Mesa and I'm glad I learned it. Uh, if you look at a Mesa, like a Marshall, in other words, if you try to use your Mesa, like a, you, like a Marshall, you're going to be very sorry. Yeah. Marshalls are like, turn them up, right? Mesa's are, as you turn up and down, you need to make adjustments along the way. Yeah. And one of the adjustments is if you turn a Mesa volume up, you turn the gain down, right? You bring the gain back, right? Uh, th that's kind of one of the things. So, so the uh, the maces are definitely one of the amps where I'm like, read the manual. Yeah, <laughs> they have a good manual, and it does more they than do. just and tell you what knobs do. They actually sample settings. Yeah, you might even be able to find for that F100. You might even be able to find the sample setting card that came with the amp. Yeah, that would be something to look for because the, the their sample settings were always really pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's, that's like I said, they write good manuals because they actually give good suggestions on things to try. Okay. So we're going to hit a couple more and then we'll call it because, well, it's my birthday. I'm going to go get ready for tomorrow. <laughs> so, okay. What do we got? Uh, the next one is, uh, it says, happy birthday, Phil. Thank you. That's from Chuck. Hey, Chuck. Uh, it says, this question is for Lawrence. What is the best amp style or best amp setting for a 68 pedal? Uh, I, I designed the 68 primarily to go with uh, Fender style clean amps. So uh, something that um, that's in that vein usually works works best. Um, Mesa Boogie would fall into that category. Vox would fall into that category. Um, obviously Fenders, most of the Fenders. Uh, would do that. So anything that's, that's nice and clean that has a slight mid scoop to it will work really well. All right. Matt says, Hey, Phil, best humbucker HSS humbucker single, single strat for blues. I'm going to say the Pete Thorne or the pearly gates. Those are my two faves for that kind of uh, pickup. Those, those are ones I'm, I feel confident telling you if you're stuck in a strat, you'd be happy. Uh, Joe says, can an electric guitar bridge be used on an acoustic body? Uh, you know, because there's nothing really to screw it into, right? Um, you have a uh, bracing underneath the acoustic bridge. Obviously the top of the acoustic bridge, uh, the bridge is glued down to the, the face of the acoustic. Um, and, and then this is one of those uh, horrible answers, which is, can it be done? Absolutely. But when I'm saying no, it means not without some serious reworking. And one of the problems is you it's not even as easy as well, you can stick a block of wood underneath because as soon as you put the block of wood, you have to cut out some bracing. Um, so this, no, yeah. <laughs> just, we're going to go with no, just all the way around. Uh, it's not going to happen. Uh, Todd says, hey, Phil and Lawrence, I'm trying to decide between a 68 drive with 
uh, with the gain and the 68 deluxe. Can you give me a quick brief uh, 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 kind of explanation, please? Sure. Keep rocking. Sure. The uh, I'm assuming that you're meaning the uh, the original 68, which had the gain toggle switch on it, versus the 68 deluxe. Um, the uh, what's added to the deluxe is probably going to be the quickest way to put that. So uh, uh, essentially, the two are very similar, with the exception that the del deluxe moves the toggle switch to a foot switch, so you can perform it, switch it, um, and it adds a uh, 24 dB adjustable foot switchable boost pre-gain boost to it. So you get a complete separate boost with the with the deluxe that is not available with the with the original 68. And that's uh, plus the ability, I guess, plus the ability to go nine to 18 volts on the deluxe, which the original is only nine volts. Um, I think that's in a nutshell. And then I'm gonna throw in here, cause it's nice cause he's here. He might choke me. Uh, 68. The 68 Deluxe with the variable s settings is how much? Two, 280, 279.99. No, no, that's the Deluxe. Oh, right, sorry. the Deluxe. Isn't that what you said? Right, oh, that's what I meant. Okay, so the Deluxe is 280. 280. And then the one, the, the, original. 68, the original 68 is how much? 250. So 30 bucks 30, more? 30 bucks more. Dude, Todd, for 30 bucks more, get here's what you get for 30 bucks more. I So, you know, I had this argument with him before. He has three versions of 68. He has the 68, which just has the, because 68s have two, they have a switch. So you get a higher gain and lower gain. So if you want the original one, which has the button, that's 250. If you want the one that just gives you the lower gain, it's uh, 189.99. So, okay. And then the deluxe is uh, 280. So to me, it's it's either you get one the one trick pony and get the sub $200 price point or get the deluxe, yeah. right? Um, I tell definitely think you should get the deluxe. I have one of each in my personal collection. I have the one with the button because that's the first one I bought off yep. you. That's yep. how we met. I right. bought that one off you. And then I have the deluxe. Um, but for 30 bucks more, it's not only that you get the ability to turn on and switch in between those two channels, you get a booster pedal too. So yeah, 30 bucks more. So his suggestion on top of that, but I'm telling you for 30 bucks, you'll be much happier to get the deluxe. Uh, Donald says, would an orange 112 be a good companion cabinet to the PRS MT-15? Uh, the MT-112 cabinet is back ordered, and I believe they have very similar specs. Thoughts? Uh, yes, I think that would be a good cabinet, because I think one of the things I like about my MT-15 is how much low end and power it's got behind it. And so I've noticed when messing with different cabinets already with it, some cabinets, uh, it's not about adding, so a lot of amps, you want a cabinet that adds a more low end to it. The MT-15, man, it has the low end. So it's just about finding cabinets that don't rob the low end because I I have tried uh, my Mesa Boogie Slant 112, sucked all the low end out of that cabinet because it's just mm -hmm. too small of a cabinet. Right. It, so yeah, I would think the orange cabinet would be great. Probably even a better resell value and a long-term use too than the PRS cabinet. And like you, I agree the PRS cabinets are back ordered to no end. I have no idea when they come. And the, those PRS cabinets are going to be made in China. So even though they're priced right. The other thing I'm looking at getting, so you know the cabinet I'm thinking about getting from AMT15, which I will probably decide this weekend, is the Eggnator 112 that's ported. It's, it's awesome. That's another one too. Uh, so check that one out. Um 269 for that cabinet. I don't know what the orange is going for, but for 269 uh, for a, uh, a 112 cabinet in today's market seems to be fair priced when yeah. everybody's trying to get 500 for a cabinet. I think the the uh, the uh, Paul Reed Smith cabinet in Main China is they're asking 389 or something like that. So just something to think about. That's what I'm decided to do is get the Eggnator cabinet. And then what this is going to be the well, hold on. Before I say that, before I say yeah, it's okay. Now these are gonna be the last ones, real quick. It's uh, from Ho I'm gonna say, what is that, Julio? I'm gonna say Marcelo. All right, sorry about that. Uh, so it says, "Hey guys, I have a 1997 Main Japan Ibanez S4 540. It's our kind of guitar. Yeah. Uh, custom, all original, plays like butter, uh, but it has terrible sustain. Yeah, <laughs> the notes uh, die." What can I do? So the reason the notes are dying is, is because it plays like butter. <laughs> the thing that you would love is causing the problem. And what I mean by that is that sustain a lot of times with the guitar first starts with the string. Okay. The string is what is moving 
And sustain is about keeping that string moving. And when that action's super low, man, that string is just, it's, it's, it's decaying off too fast. So here's what I would experiment with. There's some things you can experiment very easily, by the way. Um, what you want to do is on your bridge, make sure you use the proper Allen wrench to raise and lower your two-point tremolo. You can go ahead and raise your tremolo, but measure. I want you to measure uh, the top of the 12th fret to the bottom of the string. Just measure that distance. Go ahead and raise those two posts just ever so slightly. Maybe it's like a quarter quarter turn each. Those have the lock, the, the set screw lock inside of the yes. post too. So yes. you make sure you loosen that because you'll strip it out. Yes. And then, uh, so in other words, consult your Ibanez uh, manual. Man, you, yes. you, yeah, and you can find that online for the bridge. But what I want you to do is once you feel confident, you can do that. Raise the bridge in very small increments, okay? Raise it a little bit and play it and see if you notice it, uh, that it sustains better. And what you're trying to find is that sweet spot where you're like, okay, I can't take it this high. Calm down, but I can't take it decaying. And you might find a compromise. You'll never find the if you you'll never find that amazing sustain, but you'll find sustain you can tolerate with low action. You know what I mean? You you have to find you know what I mean a perfect uh, perfect thing. I have not yet in my life found a guitar for the most part that has action slammed to the deck and just sustains yeah. it just, there's no way that, uh, to artificially put that in um strings at the top of the frets yes yeah, st string right it's like uh, it's, as soon as that string hits the fret it's slowing down uh tony says i miss the pedal wall phil <laughs> uh happy birthday i'm picking up a schecter omen six guitar for 250 with the original hard show case how can this be question mark we'll talk about that in a second uh this guitar is like new and plays so smooth your thoughts uh, yeah, the pedal wall, wall sucks. It's actually right in front of me too. It's funny. There's a pedal wall in front of me, uh, which I didn't take down, but, uh, actually added to that, but I understand. But to me, I love this. I call it my aquarium of guitars. It looks like fish swimming around. That's around. kind of what I was going for. So, Excellent. you know, yeah, it's like when I look at it, when I'm in here, it, I wanted that same effect emotionally. Yeah, right. You know, like, yeah, these are my guitars swimming around. These are like that's my that's my uh, pirate's chest. <laughs> it's amp. Uh, it may seem silly to you guys, but here's the deal. Uh, you know, when when you work in a creative field, which you understand, I'm sure, because you work in a creative field, uh, sometimes work just is time. It's time for work, right? It's like it's hard to say. I I, the, I can't tell you how many times. Have you ever this happened? I said it a time and I go, I'm going to work from eight in the morning till five. And then I get very little done either because there's distractions, things, or creatively nothing's moving. And then six 30, I got this idea. Yeah. And so what happens is I wanted to create a, a place where I, I not only feel inspired to come up with ideas, but I, I'm, I enjoy it. So I don't, you know what I mean? Cause, cause I don't want to stifle anything. I don't want to ever sit there and just in a humdrum attitude. Right. So, all right. I know you didn't ask the question, but I told you anyways. So uh, how can how can you be buying a Schecter Omen 6 guitar for 250 with the original case? Uh, well, the great thing about Schecter guitars for some reason is they are everywhere. They are Everybody knows what a Schecter is. You see them everywhere. They uh, are well respected, highly used by great players, but yet for some reason still undervalued in the used market and easy to obtain at great prices. Uh, and that's... Uh, and you know what? Just rejoice, rejoice in that. I I I like Schecter guitars. They are they are a brand I feel safe with uh, recommending to people as a whole. I like my Schecters. I have one right there. That's my purple one right there. I was just playing. And you know what? Yeah. This is so you know he can back me up. This earlier today, I was just showing him and telling him. I go, this is probably one of my favorite ones. <laughs> and then I played it, and he were like, "You're not yeah, yeah. It's a great sounding it's guitar. guitar. And uh, no, so yeah, so yeah, you can totally find Schecters for great deals. Um, Especially if, for me, if you don't get picky, because I, I think it's funny. Sometimes I'll look at Schecter's. This is a good example. This one is the Hellraiser with uh, two EMGs. All day long, I found them for five, 600 bucks used. And then that one I bought for 250, I think, or 300 with a case, because uh, it's purple. No one wanted the purple one. And I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I thought the purple looked fine. Um, so same thing. Sometimes Schecter's the same, same thing. You just find the right deal. So funny how some colors just don't <laughs> so 
Um, okay, so uh, last ones. Uh, this is uh, for Greg. Just wish me happy birthday. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate that so much. Uh, it's the best way to spend a birthday is hanging out with everybody, good people, good talking guitars. Um, Marcelo, uh, Phil uh, sent an Ivan's question. Happy birthday. Yep, I got that question. We're good. Uh, Tig Room says, Happy birthday. Man, I love these happy birthday wishes. This is awesome. I'm going to have to drink tonight. <laughs> this is Brian Stewart. Hey, Brian, what's up, buddy? It says, Happy birthday, Phil. Ask Lawrence, how did he originally get into pedal building pedals? That is a great question. And we'll actually end with that one. Go ahead and answer that question. Um, well, I guess uh, it kind of just stemmed from, uh, I used to modify and build amps and uh, had a friend who asked if I could build him a, just a basic uh, effects loop pedal. And uh, I built it for him uh, and uh, it came together. And then he asked me to build him another, another pedal. And it just kind of stemmed from that. Uh, and then I started modifying pedals for some guys and, and it just, you know, then, then worked in a few of my own designs and it just kind of stemmed from there. That was a very unexciting answer. I know. You got know. nothing better no. than that? Well, I'd like to say that, you know, the the clock fell off the wall and hit my head and I had a great idea, you know, some Doc Brown thing. But no, re realistically, it's it stemmed from uh, from the designing and building of the uh, tube amps. And it, it was just, uh, you know. Do you enjoy making pedals more than amps? Uh, I, I do. I do. It's uh, because my, the, the, the goal that I have is to take the knowledge and the sounds that I was creating in the amps and put them in the pedals. Oh, so that's, that's why it was kind of such a natural, uh, segue into the pedals. Just, yeah, that was, that was a challenge because at the time I started doing them, uh, I, I couldn't find any pedals that actually did that. The, the, the amp in a box thing is obviously more, more popular and plentiful now, but, but then it wasn't so. Yeah, when it was right, because it was, it was more about like tube screamer esque sure. front drives, yeah, yeah, fronting amps and stuff. I, I definitely can see that now. Um, well, guys, two things. One, I want to thank Lawrence for hanging out with me today. Two, I want to thank you guys for all of the not only the great uh, birthday wishes, which was very much appreciated, but also a lot of comments about they love their sixty eight drives. Yeah, uh, which is. You know, it's awesome uh, to hear. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad, uh, especially for me, because I recommend them a lot. So it's nice to hear that you guys aren't like, man, Phil, what's with that guy in the 68 track? Uh, so uh, Showman Blues is going to be my last question. And it's because, uh, Shaman, I saw your somewhere post something about your back hurts or you're having a back problem. And he says, Phil, should I buy a Parker Fly? And you know what? I was going to reach out to you. I don't know where I saw the comment, um, but I was going to reach out to you. Uh, there are other guitars out there that are in the five and six pound weights uh, than the Parker Fly. So I would just say, look at those. As you know, I own two Parker Flies and I like them a lot, but used, you know, they're fetching $1,500 to $2,000. I think there are some great guitars out there uh, in that in that light weight range, uh, you know, so something to think about um, and suggestions. Well, right off the bat, obviously my PRS mirrors are lighter than my Parker's. Uh, there's a mirror right there. I have one up on the wall. It's lighter than my Parker. The, um, the other guitars that are nice are any kind of semi hollow guitars. Something to think about that too, as well. So you can always find a guitar in the six pound range is what I'm trying to say. And I know the Parker's say five pounds, but you're going to want, uh, some of them are about five and a half. So, um, but the other thing I ask you is if you ever played one, because if you sit, some, some people complain that the horn stabs your chest right mm. there. Um, I've never really had that problem, but boy, it's definitely a complaint. I've heard a lot and it's not like they're still in production. So you can buy one sure. stabbed in the chest. You're like, Hey, sweet water. This didn't work out when you buy them used. Uh, it's yours. So something I would, I would definitely look into and think about. Uh, is guitars. Uh, so something also to mention is like my buddy Tim is selling his uh, his uh, PRS Reclaim uh, Vela, and I'm actually helping him. So I put it on my Facebook or my uh, Reverb, and that guitar is like five and a half pounds or something like that. He has the weight on there. He sent me the pictures. So I mean, there's guitars out there like that. So there's definitely guitars that are light. All right, guys, I appreciate you guys all hanging out. 
and uh, especially asking all the great questions. And like I said, it's going to be cool. Please, please, if you're in the area, join me tomorrow. Uh, I don't know why I'm begging for work because uh, uh, I don't know what's in my head that says, hey, you know what's cooler than restringing a bunch of guitars, even restringing more guitars, but I don't mind it. Actually, believe it or not, I'm excited tomorrow for 10 a.m. till 8 p.m at the Sam Ash in Glendale, Arizona. I will literally be working for you guys uh, for free. It's free to you guys, includes the strings. The Dario is sponsoring the strings. This is how it works. Uh, Sam Ash is sponsoring the event. They're giving you guys 20% off discount accessories and effects. Uh, free some, I think free shirts, I'm not sure. Um, something like that. And then uh, the Dario is sponsoring the strings and I'm throwing in the free labor. Can't, can't, can't be anything better to do in Arizona when it's 118 than come into the music store and watch me restring guitars. So uh, uh, anyways, on that note, I'm going to say goodbye. And you can say goodbye. Bye, guys. And until next week, thank you for your time and know your gear.